Well, and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Meg Balistrieri with Project Management at Tricom. I'm just pleased to announce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of the series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our today are Jeff Tussel and Kurt Murray from Assurance Agency. Jeff is a principal at Assurance Agency and has been with the company since 2000. Jeff is the team at Assurance to focus on providing solutions to staffing companies, making Assurance the largest insurance broker to the staffing industry. Prior to Assurance Agency, Jeff was the Assistant Director of Workers' Compensation Underwriting of Safe Insurance Companies. Jeff served on the Board of Directors for the Wisconsin Association of Staffing since 2001 and is a frequent industry speaker at many conferences and events. Of his agency and has been providing insurance solutions to the staffing industry for over 10 years. He is well versed in the unique risk management needs of the staffing industry and assists staffing businesses with their risk management programs. Kurt is focused on the big picture of profitability for his clients. As a well, result, make sure they are aware of the appropriate services a insurance agency has to offer. In addition, Kurt is able to recommend industry partners help his clients maximize their profits. The agency is one of the top 100 insurance brokers in the United States and has been in insurance for the staffing industry since 1994. Their emphasis is on financial risk management programs for workers' compensation. In the Industry Insider webinar, we will discuss how staffing agencies can prepare for the insurance hard market, characterized by increasing rates, Diminishing insurance options and increased assumption of risk by staffing agencies. Here are the points Kurt and Jeff will cover. Actions every staffing agency must take in order to prepare for increasing workers' compensation rates and workers' compensation program design options to find a program that best fits your company's risk profile and tolerance. Gauge of industry best practices and marketing tools to assist with self evaluation. Advanced risk management and loss mitigation techniques in order to minimize workers' compensation claims. In this session, you will gain the tools and knowledge necessary to be prepared for the hard market and be able to gain market share and increase your profit. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the chart feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to our panel. At the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. I'll turn the floor over to Jeff and Kurt. Meg, a great introduction. Um, as Meg said, what we want to try to what we're going to cover today in, in this is the changing workers' comp marketplace. Some of the difficulties that that you're facing as staffing agency owners and some of the difficulties we're going to be facing as a, as a brokerage community to um, find cost-effective solutions. And then more important, what it is that you can do as an agency owner in order to prepare your business and tackle the strategies in order to, to mitigate those costs going forward. So agenda for today. We're going to topics. What is a hard market? Why is the hard market here? What could be manage your costs? Some potential program design options. We'll summarize actions at the very end of the presentation today. So, from defining what a hard insurance marketplace is, it's the, by decreasing capacity, increasing rates, stricter running guidelines imposed by those insurance companies that remain in the marketplace. Force increase in risk retention, and we'll cover that topic in a little bit more detail um, in the future. And then insurance companies typically will get out of the very tough classes of business to underwrite. In the insurance industry, the tougher classes tend to be construction, mining, and agricultural business, long care like nursing homes, uh, retirement communities, and then unfortunately for you, staffing. On the, regarding the decreasing capacity, for those of you that have not heard that term before, Really what that comes down to is insurance companies 
think of them in terms of a bank, in terms of only having so much money to place in, within certain classes of business, or certain types of business, certain lines of coverage. And what happens is the insurance market right now is not profitable, believe it or not. And what that means is they will either take their capacity and move it to different lines of coverage, or they'll get out of it, or they'll do different things with it. So it means that there's less dollars to go out to provide insurance to those in the marketplace, meaning you folks. So that that's the, the layperson's term, if you will, in terms of the capacity side. Specific to interesting rates, we all understand what that is. But the strict underwriting guidelines, um, you've only seen some of these up to this point, but some of the guidelines that are you're going to either experience yourself or uh, should be ready for, prepared for, they'll limit the states that they're going to do business in. Some of the obvious ones, California is is one we see quite often, and very few carriers are willing to do that, but there are others now that are included on that list. Um, they'll be much more tight on how they look at your class codes, and we're going to talk about misclassification later in our presentation. Um, the carriers available to guaranteed cost programs might only be um, even a few years ago, it was six or eight. Now we're down to really two, three, or four, depending on your type of business. So those are some of the conditions that you're going to see within the next year or two, and we'll address more today as we get into this. Uh, and those, <clears throat> excuse me, those differences will be different um, for light industrial versus IT firms versus medical firms. They'll also be different by size. So if your premiums in workers' comp are 50000 that may be very different than a person who is, say, 250000 or $500,000. The insurance industry is, is, is their profitability is measured historically based upon what's called a combined ratio. Combined ratio measures the actual premium dollars an insurance company premium again they actually pay out in claims and expenses because investment returns that the insurance companies um, make their, and their dollars invested they make money up to a ratio of about 105 percent meaning they're paying out a hundred and five they're paying dollar five for every dollar in claims and expenses for every dollar they bring in a premium this shows you historically going back over the last 10 years what the under Writing kind ratios have been for insurance companies for workers' comp. If you look back to 2002, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it's sort of declining combined ratios to the point where it were historically or at least break even. So it was a period of, of increasing insurance rates. So as, as the brokers came out to have the conversations with you, what you typically saw during that time period was declining rates. Even the operating cycle. The profitability turned in 2007 and 8. You could see the underwriting ratios, the combined ratios, were still to the point where insurance companies could make money. What the last three to four years is that the, the combined ratios have deteriorated such that the insurance companies are now losing money again for work comp. Tends to lag the profitability by a couple of years. 2010, 11, and then Projected 2012 combined ratios are supposed to be up in the low 120 to 125 range. We'll get numbers here in a couple of months. What that tells you is that they've been losing money now for the last four years. And at some point, the insurance companies do need to make a profit, as you do. So during the cycle, you'll see what we talked about earlier, increasing rates, decreasing capacity, etc. So again, this just a historical perspective on what the underwriting results look like for the industry and is the worst performing of all um, insurance coverages at this point. So, this is a change for the worse. Unfortunately, it's not a change for the better. Just your headline, um, this insurance put out a white paper recently. The headline was hard market horizon. Outline the dynamics of what the hard market would be. Uh, the, the, the reasons why is to uh, run combined ratios, which we discussed. Investment uh, marketplace now is driven by historically low interest rates, and insurance companies 
typically take very conservative investments because they need to protect capital. So interest rates decline, their their profitability or their, their investment income declines. Um, so right now marked by historically low interest rates. Cat losses, catastrophe losses are the increase. It was a relatively quiet period during the mid 2000 you know, five, seven, and eight without a lot of catastrophic losses. That's changed now was that some of the other cycles are changing changing. Um, during that session, measures being payroll and sales were declining significantly, so the insurance companies were taking in less in the way of premium to offset the actual claims. And stagnant economy is creating stagnant premium growth. Uh, you know, in a period where people are growing sales and payrolls by 20%, the insurance companies get 20% bumps in, in premium. Over the last five years, there's been no growth to, to stagnant growth. You know, and, and GDP is growing at less than 3% right now. So it's leading to a lot of growth in premiums in the industry. Companies, AIG is pulling off of $2 billion in workers' comp, more to come. That was a business insurance headline, meaning that AIG is the historically the largest underwriter of workers' comp premium for the staffing industry. This applied to just staffing, but in general, AIG, who's best all the worth of the industry, is, is, is now walking away from as much as $2 billion or more in, in workers' comp premium. Uh, California workers' comp is at a crisis point. Uh, we know over the last eight months, California's put through roughly 40 to 45 percent in rating increase because insurance companies in the state still can't be profitable even with those significant increases, and more is to come. Some indications of another 20 percent increase again this year. One is that you often hear about California. You uh, to our clients about California, and they say, well, I don't have offices in California. Why do we care so much about California? California has almost 25% of the total workers' compensation premium in the industry. So it is so remarkably unprofitable, it affects everyone. Um, not to, it, it still can depend on your own personal experience and the state you're in, but it has a huge impact on what the carriers are doing in other states. And um, you'll often hear about California, but it's because it's such a huge piece of the pie. Okay, so some of the things that, that you can do to prepare your business and, and make cost increases as, as we go into this difficult cycle. Um, we believe that the most important two things that you can do as a agency is are, are pick the right clients and pick the right employees. Easily and hard to pull off. But the most important thing you can do is actually stop a workers' comp claim from, from happening in the first place. <clears throat> so we go about doing that. Customer action is key to that. Uh, also working with the customers in order to make sure that those that you're working with, with operate safely and view safety as importantly as you do. Customer selection process should be quite intensive, um, including looking physically at the operations of the client. Um, seeing what they're doing from a safety standpoint themselves. How strong is their safety program? Do they view you as a partner? Or they, they as my sec, our second player says, is, are they hiring you because they don't want to put their own employees in harm's way? Do they want to put their employees in the uh, job employment? So you need to understand that. It's imperative that you really visit those customers that you're working with in order to do period site inspections. We recommend using a, a actual form which is those inspections in a very detailed uh, process. You can look back historically and measure the progress in making making their facility more safe. One of the things that we often hear from clients, the ones that have effective risk management programs, is that they're out uh, in the light industrial world, they're out to see clients, at least on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, in addition to that, it never hurts for you to make, we won't call them surprise inspections, but just we'll call them stop buys, where if you have one that just doesn't feel quite right, that you're making a point to just show up and make sure your people are doing what you've been told they'll do, especially maybe in an earlier relationship or one where you've had claims. Um, regarding those inspections, also 
um, as Kurt mentioned, is the form that you use. It, it's kind of twofold in that it verifies that you don't have, let's assume it's a salesperson who's out there who doesn't want to lose the client and may not understand the full picture of workers' compensation and those costs. Um, you'd have a written document that your person has filled out, completed, and it may or may not make sense later when you have a claim uh, at all they completed it. And obviously, if you do have a workers' comp claim, other than medical only, we recommend visiting the client site every single time. What to is it? Your ways understand that it's okay for them to tell a customer of yours no. If you have an employee that's hired to be a janitor and they're asked to get on a forklift and move a forklift around the same, they're not trained specifically for that placement. They should be telling that employer no, that customer of yours no, and you should be notified of that immediately so that you can have the conversation with the customer about something like that happening in the future. Too many stories around the these days of people being hired to do one thing, but the customer site, they're asked to do something completely different, which leads to improper training or which leads to an accident because of improper training, improper orientation, you know, people on ladders trying to pull Merchant off of top shelf, people climbing up on forklifts to change light bulbs. The thing I think for the temporary employees while they're at a customer site is to say no because they're worried about potentially losing their job. But you as an owner need to be employees that they have that right, they have that power to say no to, to those customers and to notify you immediately if anything like that happens. One item we be a time standpoint, weren't going to be able to get into too deeply today, but we'll mention it here. Um, regarding those situations where um, you client who has put someone in the wrong place uh, or an improper job, uh, or maybe you have a client where you just don't have the greatest relationship at the beginning and, and you wonder how to manage that, where having a client contract can come into play in, in enormous proportions in terms of just make sure that they understand that they're going to be held to a certain standard when it comes to the jobs that your person is going to be working in, the fact that you might be able to subrogate against them if they act completely, complete character in what they should be doing. Uh, and it allows for things like the site inspections and other things. On another call, we could, we could talk to you individually regarding these types of issues if you'd like to do that. The key point is <clears throat> not that you pick the right customer, picking the right employees. So how do you screen? How do you how do you vet those employees? How do you onboard? It becomes important in, in the world that you're doing the right things. So you guys are pressed for time in order to get people on. You'll get a call. You need 40 people at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's 4 o'clock the night before. But you do need to pick the right employees. Some of the tools that, that we think are important is complete a, a very thorough uh, interview of the, of the employee. You're going you're gonna to know a lot of that person from the 15 minutes that you'll spend with them. You know, these are high-level interviews for CEO positions. You don't need to spend three hours, but certainly a 15-minute conversation with the, with the person to figure out what about, about is important. Background checks, obviously, and pre-employment checks in, in there are important as well. Some of the companies, uh, some of our clients are using integrity testing today. There are several integrity testing services out there it's a, a it test that you give employees a free hire pre interview that used to screen for those employees that are subject or, or uh, have a propensity for work violence for for uh, stealing from an employer for drug and alcohol abuse uh, also meant to screen out potentially those that may file fraudulent workers comp claims. So the, the cost of those services can get expensive when you're, especially if you're talking about hiring thousands of people a year. But tens are what, Jeff? Somewhere between like five and eight dollars a person. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the tools. Also, employment drug screens are important, and then post offer medical questionnaires are becoming more and more commonplace these days. And certain states have have restrictions on when you can and can't use. Post for medical questionnaires, and again, this is post offer. It's not pre offer. It's done on a post offer basis because you can't make hiring decisions based on an employee's response to whether or not they they have a medical condition. But if you 
have post offer medical exam and you've got a facility where you're going to have 50 people. If somebody says in their medical questionnaire they've had a prior workers or prior back injury and they can't lift more than 30 pounds, you know you can't put them in a position that's, that they're going to be regularly lifting 50 pounds. So that's a tool. We recommend use, utilizing loss control and loss prevention services for, for customers. You can work with uh, your insurance company, there are outsourcers. Uh, most that specialize in this business also have loss control services available. Uh, online training libraries available as well. Assurance has re recently unveiled risk management website. In addition to of, uh, about the industry and, and, and services and discounts on, on certain vendor uh, services, it, is, it also provides a learning management system. Um, most of our clients that are using that today are finding that very helpful to train not only their internal staff, but talking about it, safe station for each of the new hires, uh, used for salespeople for on-sites, for branch management, et cetera. We also recommend remote safety. You know, there are hundreds of potential safety incentive programs out there. Some are good, some are awful. Uh, it's all what fits with your culture. But if you're looking for resources, we can we can assist with, with, with those as well. One of the things we've seen in rewarding safety is you can think of it in terms of we've seen clients get extremely innovative in this area. It, it can be something where it's rewarded all the way down to an employee basis. It's rewarded on a branch basis in terms of numbers of claims or it's even tied to the branch's uh, bonus structure. There's nothing more powerful than impacting their pocketbook when it comes to getting them to listen to the owners and managing the work comp costs. Okay, what do you do if a claim occurs? Because it's clear enough. You need to aggressively manage the claims you do have. So it's way beyond when the occurs itself. This has to do with what the insurance company, your partner in, in your insurance program, what their underwriting or what their claims adjustment philosophy is. So we recommend interviewing insurance their administrators um, and insurance companies as, as to how aggressive they will be with with the negotiations. Styles, so you need to understand what their claim philosophy is. Uh, we highly recommend setting up special handling instructions with the insurance companies when it's available. There are certain insurance companies that just won't do it, won't respond, especially if your premiums are less than certain thresholds. But as you get larger, you have more and more control over that relationship. Everything from approval increases in reserves to settlement authority to communication with, with, with your claim administration team internally can set up and negotiate it ahead of time. With the aggressively managing claims, the, the clients that we have that do this best are those that, that first and foremost, they develop a relationship with their adjuster. Um, get them to trust you. Get them to the point they're responding to you and your folks as quickly as possible. Um, and, and get them to um, react as quickly as you can. The 24 hours after a claim occurs are probably the most critical, maybe 24 to 40 hours in terms of reporting it timely. It avoids the employees getting to an attorney. Um, also, I would recommend doing post-accident drug testing on anyone who's looking to file a workers' compensation claim. But ultimately, the relationship with that adjuster is going to be a key to your success in this area. And aggressively investigate claims once they do happen as well. You need to get out and document what occurred on the, on the client site to determine if it was potentially a fraudulent claim. If it goes unwitnessed, if it's Monday morning injury, you know, you guys know the triggers. And when it occurs, be as good as possible with taking witness statements, with taking pictures of the facility, looking for video. All clients have, have uh, cameras monitoring the activity of, of all, their, all their employees if they have that. It, preserve it and save it for future use because it may be incredibly useful in denying it. A workers' comp claim. We also recommend having regular, like Jeff said, having regular contact with the claims adjusters. Uh, 
um, which also would include having regular and periodic claim reviews. Challenge reserves, you got to get your broker involved. It's that you have an advocating third party involved in those discussions. You're not to manage workers' comp claims. It is to run a staffing agency. Your company has your own agenda, you have your agenda, and you need somebody to advocate on your behalf, and that's what like currents are supposed to do. Well, men, highly that you have light duty available for those that are injured. Um, statistic after statistic after statistic prove that getting people back to work is imperative in reducing the overall cost of the claim. At home and watch TV, they feel useless, they tend to get attorneys. If they're back at work, they're feeling productive, um, they typically getting up every morning, hour, and getting ready, going to work, and they really do feel like they're still part of the workforce. They're less inclined to get an attorney uh, than those that are sitting at home. So, you know, some of the statistics will say that it reduces the cost of the claim by as much as 30 to 40 percent. And then we're going to the last topic here a little bit later. Tracking profitability by client, I think, is, is a strong move can make. Uh, it could be the old 80-20 rule where 80 of your losses are coming from 20% of your customers. And there's a couple different ways to track profitability by customer, and we're talking about profitability not only to the insurance companies, but to you as well. The customers lead to increases in the overall cost of your insurance program. And if you can isolate Losses to one, two, three, four customers of yours, then then you know we know where the problem exists. It probably doesn't exist with the bulk of of your customer relationships. It probably rests in just a handful of customers. So then the question is, what do we do with those customers? You know, do you terminate the relationships. Do you try to rehabilitate them? Um, there's a lot of things you can do. You can increasing your markups on that particular customer to cover the cost of the claim, and if you can take those results, if you could show that your customer were they causing your overall insurance increase, increase maybe very helpful in you being able to negotiate higher rates for them, getting them to, to recognize the fact that they are the problem with your insurance program and they tend to get more more, more uh, positive at that point. One of the difficulties that we'll have that are getting into workers' comp and better understanding it that we've had before is. How do I know if it's profitable or not? So for those that are really just starting this process or are looking to just start this process, one of the things that you can do is take a calendar year or a, a an insurance policy year for a client, determine how much premium you were charged for having that client, and look at the losses that you've had for them, and do it over a couple of years. One year shouldn't make or break you, but at the end of the day, what you should expect is that the total premiums that you were charged, they should have less than half of that number in claims, significantly less than half, but as a rule, absolutely less than half. And if it's over that number, most likely it's a, an unprofitable client for you, um, and one that you'd either consider terminating or make some changes like Kurt was outlining. One of the things you can do if terminated, that you still want to continue to do work with the customer, but they are causing a, a disproportionate number of claims, take that one, two, three, four customers off of your main workers' comp program and move it off to a separately insured workers' comp policy. You can do that through any number of different means. Once we end up putting that, that policy in the state assigned risk pool, obviously it's going to have an increase in rates over what you're currently paying. But again, if you're, let's say, the store you've been paying $300,000 of workers' comp rates, you suffer a 20% overall increase in your workers' comp program because of an unprofitable customer to the insurance company, you could look at it as a $60,000 increase in overall workers' comp premium. But take that customer, isolate them off. We can show the underwriters that, okay, the bulk of the claims are coming from this customer. We're insuring that customer through this workers' comp program. We can just go back and remove those claims, remove that draw, and show them that overall, otherwise, it's, it's been a profitable relationship. Take that customer and throw it off in the assigned risk pool. Maybe a C of five or six, maybe 
$10,000 increase, but you're preserving the balance of the Good Workers' Comp program. It may end up saving you overall tens of thousands of dollars over what the cost might have been. So, quite important is make sure you're using the right workers' comp classifications for your customers. It's a unique business in that most, most inspires have two, three workers' comp on their policy. You staffing agency, use the workers' comp code assigned to the operations of your customer. So you probably have 100 or more workers' comp codes on your policy. Making sure you're using the right workers' comp code is hugely important in the overall determination of what your premiums are. There are subtle differences in the descriptions of the workers' comp classifications that are potentially used. The difference of $10 in rate, you know, fire or for 100 in rates. So as it stands now, the NCCI, which governs operations in about 35 states, uses 600 different workers' comp classes. For you to be able to, to manage that, it's incredibly difficult because you need to know the ins and outs of all the classification manuals. States like California, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, among us, have their own classification manuals. So you just add on more and more. Ultimately, there's, there's more than 2,000 workers' comp codes available around the, around the country. So you need to rely on somebody who understands the workers' comp me classification mechanism. Maybe the state regulator, which might be the insurance underwriter, which which likely means your broker should be involved in helping you make these decisions. Since if you step in, there's a question from Steve uh, on the call, and his question is, how do you split off certain customers from the main policy? Oh, good question, Steve. Uh, it entails actually setting up a separate entity. So you'd have to have a separate federal ID number to that, that particular customer too. So if you've got ABC staffing, your main operations, you'd have to set up a separate company with X, XB staffing, for example, separate EIN. The reason is that the workers' programs are purchased and underwritten based upon your employer ID number. So we could not put workers' comp policies in place in the, in the same state for the same employer. We'd have to have a separate entity. Hopefully that is your question. And if you have further questions about it, I'm going to give either Jeff or myself a call. What's on here is you, the best thing is you need to focus on classifying the, your operations. Our risk management website, staffing, RM, actually has a lot of classification uh, procedures and education on it. But check that website out. There's a, one of the tabs on there for classifications. You can go to that, and there's a lot of free information. There. Some of what's on there is only accessible to current clients, but there's all the educational materials on there that are uh, free taking. One of the uh, things I mentioned earlier was that the insurance industry is really forcing insurance buyers to take risks. So we want to take a few minutes here and talk about the different types of program design options for you as a, as a staffing agency. Uh, because if the others further and further away from the day-to-day -day claims of frequency, your overall cost of your insurance decreases, but it becomes uh, more by your actual claim results than premiums. So the first and the, 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 the stepping stone for most is what's called the guaranteed cost or first dollar workers' comp policy. It, it's what a lot of you are purchasing today, where you're paying a fixed rate per $100 of payroll. Uh, and that varies only based upon the workers' comp classifications that are that are used in your payroll within the state. It's pre-negotiated up front. Uh, there's some benefit that coverage available in all states. There's no collateral or letters of credit necessary, and you have a defined risk. So you know your rates at the beginning of the year. You know your rates at the end of the year. None changes. Obviously included within it is your experience modification as well. One of the things that we're going to talk about as we go through these different design options are um, there are different premium thresholds in terms of um, what type of program might be available to you and your company. Uh, those thresholds can also differ based on the type of placements that you do. So 
a lot of obviously what we're refu referring to here throughout our presentation are for the light industrial folks. Um, so I'll give an example on the guaranteed cost side. A minimum premium that the few carriers that are left are really looking for in the light industrial side is about 100000 in annual premiums. Now, there are a number of caveats within that. It depends on your state. There are different carriers throughout the country, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a very loose general um, number we would give you. But if you're doing just IT placements, that's, there's virtually no minimum premium if that's exclusively what you're doing. Staffing might, might be different. It depends. There are some programs out there for that. Um, you may really get that done at, at a 50000 or more minimum premium threshold. But we'll talk about those premium thresholds as we look at each of these designs going forward. Step the risk ladder a little bit. Let's call the dividend program. These are really difficult to find these days if they exist at all. Uh, we're making it only because it is a program that has historically been unavailable. So you're paying in the same sort of premiums you would pay with a guaranteed cost plan that we just mentioned. With the exception, if your if your overall claim results are below a certain threshold at the end of the policy year, you will give you money back. You have to pay more than what you've agreed to pay up front. Uh, but the potential is to get you know in plans if if they're uh, not hugely rewarding, but you might get up to 20 or 25 percent of the premium back, which is certainly better than not getting anything back. So for those of you that have good history, these premiums. Two fifteen above. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good number to to <clears throat> guess at. The the only um, market I can tell you is really providing dividend plans is exclusive to the state of Texas is Texas Mutual. Um, other than that one, uh, I I don't believe you're going to find that option. Or if you do, please call because we'd be curious <laughs> who's offering that. I mean, it actually does too. Their, okay, their state fund does too. <laughs> so the other forty eight states, if you find one, let us know. Next step up the risk ladder is what's called a retrospectively rated plan. One that actually your premiums will fluctuate based upon your actual cost results. So historically paid premiums into a program like this equal to what the guarantee cost premiums would have been. However, six months after the policy expires, the premiums are then ultimately adjusted upwards or downwards based upon your actual claims. Typically, about 35% of the premium dollars are allocated to cover fixed costs, so those are monies that you'll pay to the insurance company that, are, that they'll use to cover their fixed expenses. 65, 70% of the premium is allocated to cover your cost dollars. So looking at so if your loss ratio is less than 70%, something this might make sense. Minimum. We're looking at probably 500000 on an annual basis in minimum premium for a retro. Sometimes you can get it less than that. There are a couple players who were in this market for a long time who, who either stopped being involved in staffing or are doing anything new in this area. So it's actually becoming a fairly limited marketplace for troves, but um, depending on your size, depending on uh, your loss history, we still might be able to find something for you in this area. Another question from Steve, actually. Um, who writes that type of program for light industrial? What type of which type we done guaranteed cost or? Yeah, Steve, I'm sending you a chat here quickly to ask that question. Okay. Well, it, we'll answer it in general. He said retro. Retro. Yeah. In general, the insurance for the industry these days that there's there's two mayors and that's AIG and Zurich. Aside from that, a lot of the a lot of what we do as brokers is is kind of one-off deals with underwriters. You know, we we have relationships with a lot of insurance companies. We use probably overall about 15 insurance companies, 15, 18 insurance companies today underwrite our temp staffing business. Um, a lot of the companies we work with, they've built a handful, two, three, or four deals for us uh, only because of the strength of, of, you know, what we do as a broker with, with the relationships we carry with the insurance companies, but also a lot of the risk management services and, and education that we're able to provide to, to customers. So, Stephen, answer that question. It's, there are a lot of one-off deals that, that we do, and I can't we can't really say with a brush that any particular company is going to going to write these on a regular basis. The one that we're doing is that Jeff referred to earlier out of the staffing market about six months ago. 
writing in force in about what 18, 18 20 states at that yeah. time. Yeah, and and one that many of you ha would know because they're the largest writer of work comp is Liberty Mutual, who um, stopped doing new staffing companies about I don't know five six years ago. They still do some. Uh, they still do them on a retrospective basis, and um, but but again they won't do any new. And to clarify, uh, um, for Steve he asked if if Charter AIG are the same. We we just got used to calling it Chartus <laughs> when they switched back to AIG. So um, that plans for you. And the benefits are if you if you have good claims, it's going to be rewarded. There may not be necessity for collateral or less credit depending upon how you structure the program. The retrospective plan will require collateral, so it's it's individually determined. You've got to define risks, so, so there's it's it's defined on the potential upswing, meaning additional premium, as well as on the, the downswing. So you just measure whether it's, it's beneficial to you to, to move forward with a program such as that. Up the road are large deductible plans. Uh, typically, when we say large deductible, we mean in excess of using the risk up to or at least $250,000 per claim and above. So you really need to be of significant size in order to entertain a program such as this. Um, typically, we see it, those companies that are running no less than $25 million in payroll, but, but you know, really, it's realistically, you've got to be generating at least about a million dollars in premium in order to entertain a program like this. So the benefits to it, the cash flow is better because historically paying the insurance company just a portion of the overall would have been your overall premium which usually runs again about 30, 35 percent of your premium, but then you reimburse them monthly for the actual claims that that they pay out on your behalf, um, up to that predefined threshold of, of let's just say two fifty thousand dollars per claim is the most typical deductible amount we see. But we've got clients with deductibles as, as much million dollars per claim. At large deductible plans, as we as we go up the ladder, like Kurt had mentioned, um, this is not for one who's uh, faint of I mean, there's serious risk involved here. You have to be completely comfortable that your risk management program is as tight as you can, can get it. I'm comfortable with the risk, comfortable with clients have, comfortable with uh, the contracts that you have in place. And in addition to all of that, you have to understand that on a large deductible plan, you're, you're really changing from an insurance program really more of a financial risk is all that you become to the insurance company. So um, the, the biggest issue that they're going to have is if you were to not reimburse them for the claims that you're handling, oftentimes the requirement that you'll see are true audited financial statements. When we say audited, we're talking they sit in your office for a week um, and, and do that type of a statement or reviewed statements are a lot of carriers will accept that. If, if you only have internal statements, or just a compilation done by your CPA, you may not even be able to get a quote within this range. You are a financial risk that in today's day and age, you have to be a really good financial risk to be able to get coverage. And then up in the risk spectrum is uh, something that's incredibly rare for the staffing industry especially, but that's pure self-insurance. So people are being self-insured and this typically means that they're taking large deductible plans, but there is a possibility that you get self self insured, which means that you have to be an improved self insured in each state in which you operate. So you have to go to each department of insurance within the state that you're operating in able to operate as a self insured. It doesn't mean that you're taking unlimited risk. You're still going to be forced by the state to buy reinsurance above a predefined level, and that's going to be determined by the state itself. Um, again, typically we see self-insureds with um, assumption of risk at least a half a million dollars per claim and above. So it's another step up because you're buying reinsurance at $250,000 per claim. You're typically buying it at, at a half a million to a million dollars per claim and above. Uh, requires that you go out and certain service providers, including an accountant, an attorney, a third-party administrator to handle your claims, et cetera. And the, the state requires that you actually have a licensed third-party administrator on the program as well. So this is more like in the state of Illinois, where Jeff Amasile 
typically of what two or three four self insured staffing agencies in the entire state. We recommend that you use a broker that knows this business. <clears throat> um, as Jeff and I talked about earlier, is you know we have relationships with underwriters, and they'll do deals for us that, that typically are not doing for other brokers because of our, our value within this industry. We know the industry. We know buyers. We know how to help you. Um, the community recognizes the fact that that is important. Because we protect them in the process, in addition to keeping your costs down. Oh, and you guys have a lot beyond workers' comp. There's a lot of other insurance issues that that, that go into for coverage for you, including a lot of contractual risks you take, which we're really not here to talk about today. That's a whole other hour webinar. So you know, set up to hand, handle the data risk needs. You know, we can help you with classification assistance, uh, contract review, claim advocacy. Um, all review. We're, we're at this point disputing probably seventy percent of the audits that come through our office are are argued with the insurance company because of improper assignment of payroll or misclassifications. Uh, our safety department knows industry. We can help you set up programs. We can help you lost control at your individual client site. Um, the staffing risk management portal that we mentioned earlier is set up solely for the staffing industry, and, and the services and offerings on there are specific to this industry. No fear, but and within that, um, there, there in this hard market, this is where you're going to see your broker do the best work for you. Um, we've had some deals in the last few months, or even nine months a year, where holding the increase to ten percent or twelve percent has been a huge win in comparison to where the underwriters are coming out of the box. So. Um, just work with someone who knows the industry. It'll put you miles ahead. A piece of advice is <clears throat> don't necessarily buy the cheapest insurance policy. Cheap is defined as the lowest cost up front. Because there's a lot of things that go into the warm of your workers' comp policy. If you're if you're buying insurance from an insurance company that doesn't have services, that, that has a very lax posture on claims, um, that doesn't provide you with safety services. I believe the cost of your program will will be higher in two years than it is today. If well, you had an option to spend three or five percent more to get with an insurance company that gets this industry, with a broker who understands this industry, we may, will probably be able to help you save <clears throat> exponentially more than that over the cost of of the relationship or over the time of the relationship. Um, you know our. You can point on there about why it is important. Um, the well, big picture when purchasing insurance. Right. Summary of what you need to do. A workers' comp program and which structure is best for your business. Prevent sensible claims. When it does happen, get as aggressive as you can with managing those costs. Um, so workers, use the correct workers' comp classification. Your broker, and then buy the right program. So overall, that's what we wanted to cover today. Um, we fielded a couple of questions during during that we've uh, been on the specific slides. If you have any additional questions for us, go ahead. Over via the chat feature. While we're for that, one of the uh, questions that Kurt and I can discuss for a minute. The question that we get oftentimes is, of the clients who've had significant increases over the past year, what were the key factors within that? Probably, probably the biggest single factor is that, obviously, they were having poor loss experience. That's an easy answer. But there, there are other parts to that as well. Of all that we mentioned from a risk management program, if things are not in place, it makes it very difficult to sit down with the underwriter and explain to them why limiting the increase or keeping them from non-renewing the account should be done. You need to be able to have a story behind why you've had some claims issues um, and, and an answer such as 
um, the claims were handled poorly by the carrier, just is it just doesn't cut it anymore. Some of those easy answers over the last few years, the underwriters just don't listen to that. So, so um, other ones to keeping those increases at minimum. A uh, big one is what Kurt had talked about in terms of look, this client was obviously one that was unprofitable for us. We no longer have that, that client. Now you can remove that associate payroll and losses and underwriter look at your account significantly differently. Um, factors within it would be who you have on staff to work with the carrier. You should sit down and meet with either the underwriter or the carrier prior to, to the renewal and their comfort level, not only with you as the owner, uh, maybe your financial condition, but also the people you have on staff can be huge pieces to getting your renewal done without the increases that your competitors are seeing. Question, Steve. Uh, Want to question? Sure. Steve is asking if we think the ACA will change the work comp programs available over time. Um, you talk a long webinar. We could really get into this if we went into a 24-hour product um, to what. You, you provide a product that was covering not only the health and benefits side of the world, but also for them when they're on the job under workers' compensation. Um, th that marriage in terms of the carriers, in terms of all the factors involved in that, I was actually involved in designing what was a failed 24-hour product about 15 years ago, so I'm a little bit familiar with that. That is a very, very difficult product to put together. Um, I, I do believe, Steve, within your question where it could have an effect is if you have folks, let, let's assume you have someone who's working for you today that is out with one of your clients, and um, after workday is done, they go home and are injured, and today maybe they don't have health care. And now after the Affordable Care Act in 2014, they do have that. that. Now they have a means to handle that type of situation, that injury, or, or whatever it may be, whereas maybe today they don't have health care coverage. And yes, I do believe that will have an impact on workers' comp in terms of improving the results that we're seeing. I'm not one of those, just in my own humble opinion, I'm not one where I think it will have an enormous impact on workers' compensation. Um, I believe that at the end of the day, when you're comparing the two, some file claim under work comp has their medical taken care of for free, and they get paid if they're off of work two thirds of their salary or hourly wage. Water on that work comp claim. Oftentimes, the people who are filing those types of claims are street smart and know that that's a better place for them. They don't really care which plane, if you will, it should go under. So, not if I'm completely answering your question there, but those are kind of the initial thoughts off the top of my head. And a question from Angela. As a small staffing firm with very limited exposure to claims, we are having a difficult time finding options other than assigned risk through state. Um, or, or comp, or, excuse me, work comp code is 8810 for our employees. Uh, we are shopping currently for options, wondering if smaller firms are experiencing the same in terms of cares in, in your experience uh, in working with your clients. If you have just an 8810, so clerical or administrative exposure, there are there actually some cases that will do that down to virtually no minimum premium. Um, unless you have poor loss experience, which it does not sound like you have, um, we, we can really help you with that. I believe we, we can find you at least one or, or more solutions for that issue. As Jeff mentioned earlier, if you're placing clerical or IT um Staff typically the minimum premiums are significantly less, and especially when you're doing solely work with engineers, architects, accountants, clerical, professional placements, we can down three thousand dollars. I mean, it's it that, that's a fairly simple placement, assuming there are no claims. Nothing right now. Anybody hey. else? We um, sincerely appreciate everybody's time. We we, we appreciate. Tricom for hosting the webinar today and allowing us the opportunity to present to you. Um, if you have any questions, both Jeff and my contact information is, is up on the screen. So feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'd be 
happy to address uh, whatever questions or concerns you have. Uh, right back over to you. Unmute Meg. Here you go. Sorry. I'd like to thank the participants as well as Jeff and Kurt for sharing their knowledge. Uh, again, contact Jeff or Kurt if there's any assistance you need. Thank you.